The role of an economist is something that most people, even career economists themselves, don't always fully understand. People that actually become career economists spend most of their time as advisors to decision makers in global companies, organisations and governments. Economists are relied on to use their understanding of the social science to make projections about how big decisions could play out on an individual, national or occasionally even a global level. Now you probably already know what I'm about to say. Nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. But that doesn't mean that their advice on these decisions is not worth listening to, and we'll see a perfect example of that later in this very video. Good economists are kind of like good lawyers. They can't tell you exactly what's going to happen in the future, and any that claim that they do know exactly what is going to happen are either really dumb or really dodgy. Now while they can't predict the future, what they can do is present some likely scenarios and then offer advice on how to deal with those scenarios if and when they happen. But the thing that most of these big decision makers want to know more than anything from their lawyers and economists about their potential plans is what could possibly go wrong and how do I fix it if it does. It's for this reason that economists spend a lot of their time talking about worst case scenarios and they get a reputation for being eternal pessimists. But that's what they're meant to do. You wouldn't get a divorce lawyer to write your wedding vows just like you wouldn't get an economist to tell you about how great the future could be. So in the spirit of being good economists, it's worth exploring some of the so-called mega threats that could genuinely reduce quality of life for almost everyone. Even if they don't end up coming true, it's better to know what is worrying some of the greatest economists of our time and what they are proposing as solutions to the problems that we could be facing in the not too distant future. So instead of answering a series of questions in this video, we're going to look at what most economists have highlighted as the biggest threats to our economic prosperity in the next century. And those are the end of globalisation and the shift towards more self-sufficient national economies, the end of easy money causing a stagflationary crisis, the mother of all debt crises that's been slowly growing in the background of the global economy, the threat to worker and consumer based economies posed by artificial intelligence, and of course climate change and our economic response to fixing it. And I guess we also need to ask one question, which is of course, what are the solutions to these problems? After we've done all of that, and just for a bit of fun, we can put the global economy on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. Globalisation is the process of countries opening up to one another, building relationships based on the transfer of goods and services, labour, technology, investments and information. By sharing these precious resources around, all of the countries involved in globalisation can become wealthier overall. If, for example, a country invents some new technology that allows twice as much food to be grown on the same piece of land, then they could share that technology with all of the other countries in the world and suddenly the global supply of food would double. This is obviously great for all of the other countries that benefited from receiving that technology that they wouldn't have otherwise in a totally closed off global economy, but it can also benefit the country that invented the technology as well. If that country sells that technology, they could make much more money than they would have by just farming and selling their excess food supply separately. They can use this money to import other stuff so that everybody ends up with more resources overall. One of the biggest reasons why countries like Japan, China, Taiwan and South Korea were able to grow so rapidly over the past five decades as compared to countries like the UK and the USA, which took centuries to fully industrialise, is because they did not need to create everything from scratch. China didn't need to invent modern electrical grids and production lines, it could just import the technology from countries that already had the expertise in making these tools so they could get straight to business making cheap consumer goods to kickstart their economy. Even outside of sharing technology, certain countries just do certain things better than others. My home of Australia has some of the largest deposits of natural resources in the world, but we have a tiny population that demand very high salaries. So refining those resources and turning them into end products is possible, but they would be very expensive and not very plentiful. It's much more economically advantageous for us to harvest those resources and sell them directly to countries that can cheaply and efficiently turn them into stuff that then can be sold all over the world, including back to Australia. Australia will make more money and end up with more resources than if they tried to do everything themselves. This is the basic concept of comparative advantage, and it's a big reason why the world has become so much wealthier as we've started trading more. But this process is starting to reverse. While making this video, we were lucky enough to speak to Dr Nouriel Roubini, who was a senior economist in the Council of Economic Advisers for the Clinton administration, a senior advisor to Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, a professor at Yale and a consultant to the World Bank, Federal Reserve and the International Monetary Fund. During his time working for these organisations, he was one of the few voices that warned of the economic threats posed by the financial processes that led to the 2008 global financial crisis. He has also published a series of books and academic papers including Mega Threats, The 10 Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them, which was a big inspiration for this video. He's not paying us to say this, but it is genuinely a great read if you enjoy having a nerdy economics existential crisis before heading to bed. Anyway, if anybody in the world had a front row seat to global economic trends, it would be this man, and he's starting to warning about this reversal of globalisation. 
a trend away from globalization, actually, I think is going to make, on average, everybody poorer. And the most specific example I can give is the following one. You know, in Europe, the UK decided to go for Brexit. And today, inflation in the UK is already double digits. And even the Bank of England expects that the UK is going to have six quarters of negative economic growth. So there'll be stagflation, recession, and inflation. So while continental Europe and Europe and Eurozone are also challenged, their inflation is lower. And so far, they've avoided an outside recession. While in the UK, there is recession and inflation. If you want to get access to our full unedited interview with Dr. Rubini, you can listen to it on Spotify by searching for Economics Explained, and we'll leave a link to it in the video description as well. The global pandemic, an active war in Europe, and escalating tensions between the world's two largest economies are making governments and corporations much more careful about who they trade with and where they set up their supply chains. Companies have had a lot of problems in these past three years getting supplies to complete products to put on shelves. The most efficient way to supply goods and services to any market is the just-in-time approach. This is where goods and services are produced and delivered at the very moment they are demanded. A concept that sounds simple enough in theory is actually incredibly difficult because a lot of the products that we take for granted have components from dozens of countries made from resources extracted from dozens of other countries. These raw materials and component parts also have to be delivered just in time, so there is a lot of things that can go wrong here. If supply chain engineers can get this delicate ballet just right though, it can be truly magical. Just in time means that resources aren't wasted on storage, things don't expire, and when improvements are made to components or end products, they can be changed instantly instead of having to wait to sell out or just discarding outdated goods. The global pandemic and a series of large economic shocks like the war in Ukraine, Brexit, and ongoing trade tensions has made coordinating this fragile system basically impossible. Governments and companies have had to adopt a just-in-case strategy where they order enough goods and services in advance to run their operations no matter what happens. Going away from a world of fair of uh, free trade to a world of fair trade or secure trade, going away from uh, a world of offshoring to a world of French shoring or reshoring, going away from just in time global supply chains to just in case and redundance may provide you greater geopolitical security, but it comes at a cost because you're going to be producing goods and services not where it's, it is. Uh, most efficient, less costly, but where is more expensive. Just in case is much more expensive than just in time. But when the alternative is empty shelves, it's a cost most companies are willing to pay. And by pay, I mean obviously pass along to their consumers. Now you might just think this sounds like an inconvenience for businesses that are going to have to rent out more warehouse space, but those costs are going to be passed along to consumers as higher prices. And this shift in strategy is also going to mean less collaboration between countries, which means less sharing of resources, technology, and everything else that has made the world a richer place in recent decades. There are some people that are celebrating the idea of less globalization because it means less jobs being sent overseas and more stuff being done in their own country. In our upcoming video on Zimbabwe, we will explore how the country is trying to make sure all the lithium it mines is refined in the country before it's exported overseas so that more value adding takes place in its economy and hopefully more jobs are created. The example from earlier with Australia exporting its raw materials is also a hotly debated issue and many people don't like the idea that we're selling iron ore to Japan just so it can turn it into cars and sell it back to us at a 1000% markup. This animosity towards globalisation is understandable, but it is still something that has on average made us all a lot wealthier. A shift away from globalisation is going to have a meaningful impact on uh, potential growth is one of those uh, stagflationary shocks that can reduce potential growth and increase the cost of production. It's true that uh, globalization has had, uh, you know, winners and losers. Uh, the economic ties become bigger, but some workers, some firms have been better off. Some of them have been worse off. But a trend away from globalization, actually, I think is going to make, on average, everybody poorer. This breakdown of global commerce is also coming to us when we can least afford it, all while we're staring down the barrel of the mother of all debt crises. Global public and private sector debt has grown from around 100% of global GDP in 1970, to 200% in 2000, to 250% today. Now growing debt levels are something that are often thrown around by people trying to claim that our entire economic system is on the verge of collapse, and normally these concerns are overblown. Countries like the USA can get away with maintaining relatively high levels of government debt because they control their own currency. It's also the world's reserve currency, which means that having a healthy level of debt allows large institutions and other governments to hold their reserves as government bonds instead of straight cash. 
Japan, for example, has trillions in US dollar foreign currency reserves, but they don't keep those reserves as cash in a vault or even digits in a bank account. They keep those reserves as government bonds. The bonds are much easier to keep at that sort of scale, and they even pay some interest, which is nice. It would be much harder for a country like Japan to keep US dollars as straight cash. If the US government didn't have debt, then there wouldn't be government bonds, which would make it harder to use those US dollars as a medium of economic exchange, and that could potentially lead to international institutions looking for alternatives that did have active debt markets. So that was a quick little side lesson as to why debt can be good, but it can also be very bad. For starters, and I know this might shock my American viewers, but there are other countries in the world apart from the USA, and apart from maybe a dozen other advanced economies, most of them can't borrow money using their own currency. Countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka have found themselves in serious economic trouble because they have taken on massive loans in American dollars and Chinese RMB and then temporarily lost their ability to receive those currencies from abroad. While the USA and places like Japan can get away with borrowing more than their GDP, a country like Pakistan has run into problems with government borrowing that is only 88% of their GDP. Now we've already covered this topic extensively in our two videos on Pakistan and Sri Lanka, so I don't want to repeat too much here, but these two examples are just the tip of the iceberg, and borrowing in emerging markets has grown significantly in the last two decades. Taking on lots of debt to make vital investments into infrastructure and economic services was a strategy adopted by a lot of emerging economies wanting to emulate the success of other high growth countries. Two decades of low interest rates meant that there wasn't much risk with these loans, but now these fragile economies have record debt burdens and interest rates are on the rise. The story of Pakistan and Sri Lanka are just the first chapters in what Dr Rubini called the mother of all debt crises. What the level of debt is sustainable or not depends on many factors, but the point I make in the book was that while debt ratios in principle were unsustainable, until two years ago, debt servicing ratio, or the interest you paid on your debt, was very low. Because you had uh, zero policy rates, negative policy rates, quantitative easing and credit easing, keeping even long-term private and public rates low, if not negative. You know, two years ago, there was $18 trillion equivalent of public debt between Europe and Japan, that the yield that was negative in nominal terms at maturity up to 10 years. In Scandinavia, like Denmark, mortgages, long-term mortgages had a negative yield because, you know, you had negative policy rates and the spread of mortgages over that implied negative interest rates on your mortgages. So, of course, debt ratio were unsustainable, but debt servicing ratio were so low that it looked like debts were sustainable. And uh, we actually reacted to the GFC and the COVID crisis with more monetary fiscal credit easing, zero rates, negative, even more aggressive quantitative and credit easing. But now the party is over and it's over because all this easing led not only to asset inflation, but now finally, because of negative supply shock and excessive aggregate demand, has led to goods and service inflation. And central banks now have to increase interest rates uh, to fight inflation. Governments are not the only ones that have been taking on lots of debt. Businesses and households are also holding on to record amounts. Business debt has often been considered by economists as a good type of debt, because businesses normally only take out loans if they think that they can use the money to make returns that are higher than the principal plus interest rate payments. The problem with this conventional assumption is that a lot of businesses also got used to cheap debt, so it became more and more commercially advantageous to take on big loans to fund expansion, or sometimes even just to buy their own shares back from the market, which made their investors very happy. Not many of these companies expected the cost of borrowing to triple in two years, and now they're in a position where consumer demand may be waning at the same time that they need to make much larger repayments on their loans. Rubini spoke about the rise of zombie companies and even zombie countries, which provide no real economic value to the global system, but have been kept alive simply because market conditions have been artificially kept so favourable. We cannot generalise, even within uh, emerging markets or frontier economies, there are countries with better macro and structural policies, there are countries that are much more fragile. You know, the IMF and the World Bank have identified about 80 countries, mostly poor uh, developing countries, some of them emerging markets like uh, the one you mentioned, uh, that are Lebanon, uh, Pakistan, Zambia, Sri Lanka, that are having a debt crisis. Um, uh, but there are about 80 countries that have debt servicing problems and will have to restructure orderly or otherwise there's debt ratio. So there will be a debt crisis in many countries. These same global companies and emerging economies are exactly the same group that is going to be hardest hit by a move away from globalisation as well. 
Most countries start their economic development by providing low-cost manufacturing or services to larger and more advanced economies. If the trend is to bring manufacturing and services back onshore, they're going to miss out on that source of income at the same time that their record debts start to become very expensive. If that wasn't bad enough, then there are still the economic unknowns. Climate change is a major economic threat that is going to affect us all, but once again, it's likely to be the poorest countries that bear the brunt of the burden, no matter how it plays out. To reduce the effects of climate change, we need to reduce emissions. To reduce emissions, we either need to make large investments into alternative energy sources and storage infrastructure, reduce output, or make even bigger investments into carbon capture technologies, or some really wild ideas like space shades to block a small portion of sunlight hitting the Earth. Poor countries can't afford to make large investments into new technologies, and for now, economic growth still does depend heavily on burning fossil fuels to power industry. It's also not fair to tell emerging economies that we're giving up economic growth to control emissions. People in advanced economies could live just fine if economic growth stagnated, but billions of people in the world right now are on the cusp of getting access to a lot of luxuries that we in the West take for granted. Consistent electricity, clean running water, efficient transportation, access to the internet, machines to make domestic duties less labour intensive, advanced medical care and good quality housing. It's stuff that people in advanced economies don't even think about, but we only got to that point by growing our economies, mostly by burning fossil fuels. Even if for some reason these economies did get on board with the idea of slowing economic growth for the greater good, there is still the problem of how to enforce it. If all other economies slowed down their industries or made big expensive investments into renewables, that would be great. But a few opportunistic countries might just take advantage to grow their industries with cheap fossil fuels and outcompete their rivals by providing cheaper goods and services to the global economy and their own domestic markets. Economists call this the free rider problem, and it's one of the biggest reasons that progress on a lot of these issues has been so slow. In the book, for each one of the 10 mega threats, I discuss the solutions in detail, but I make the point that the economy recognizes there is never a free lunch. The solution of any kind of issue implies costs and sacrifices in the short run for the common good and the benefit of a society or a country or the world over the medium long term. And many times uh, it's hard to make those sacrifices in the short run because they're individually costly, because we discount the future. We hope that maybe some miracle or technology will resolve the problems. And politicians that will need to be re-elected, and even in an authoritarian country, they need uh, legitimacy. Uh, you know, they tend to kick the can down the road because the political economy of reform is that the costs are in the short run, the benefits are medium long term, and you might not be in power if you do painful reform, you know. The now disgraced uh, former chancellor of Germany, Schroeder, when he was in power, he did the reform, including of the labor market that led uh, Germany to become uber competitive. But guess what? At the next election, is kicked out of power. And the lesson for most uh, politicians is don't rock the boat, don't do painful reform, because they're going to lose power. Nobody wants to be the world leader that made their people sacrifice their economic prosperity for the good of other countries that are doing nothing to help themselves. The other alternative is to do nothing, but the scientific consensus is that this will result in an increase in natural disasters which we are already starting to see. These again hurt developing economies more than established economies. They don't have the tools and resources to defend themselves from these events and pay for the damage once it's been done. One of the reasons that the economy of Pakistan is on the verge of total economic collapse is because of a flood that killed 1,700 people and did $30 billion worth of economic damage in an economy with a total economic output of only $348 billion. Finally, there is the rise of technologies that could replace labour. Typically, economists believe that labour was the only thing that could produce output. The other factors of production, capital and land, only made it possible for labour to produce more output. But without labour, nothing got done. Capital advancements like machinery and even robots didn't replace labour so much as they made it possible for the same amount of labour to produce more stuff. But some are now speculating that new technologies can so comprehensively emulate the function of human labour that we could make actual people totally redundant. Nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. And all of these predictions are exactly that. Predictions. Dr Rubini, the person that we consulted with to make this video, has his fair share of critics that say he's just overly pessimistic, earning him the nickname Dr Doom. But that's really the role of a good economist. It's better to do something about a false alarm than to do nothing about a building on fire. The solutions will not be fun for anybody, but the alternatives will be worse, and hoping for new technology to save the day is a risky bet to make when the stakes are this high. Okay, just for fun after a not so fun video, it's time to put the global economy on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. Starting with size, the global economy has a GDP of $96 trillion, and it's probably going to reach $100 trillion this year. Now, my 0 to 10 scale wasn't really made for this, so 
Let's give it a 10 out of 10, but only because it can't go any higher. GDP per capita is, uh, well, unsurprisingly, right in line with the global average of $12,234. This is more than double what it was just two decades ago, and goes to show just how valuable economic growth can be to people less fortunate than ourselves. A doubling of output means that the average person now has twice as much general economic prosperity as they did a generation ago. But since the global average is exactly in line with the global average, it gets a 5 out of 10. Stability and confidence is high because of the general diversity of including every single economy in the world, in the same way that a portfolio of stocks and bonds will be more stable than any one stock picked individually. It gets a 9 out of 10, only because it's still susceptible to global trends that some select economies can ride out. Growth has been shockingly good. The rise of China has boosted the average, but the last two decades have been the most intense period of economic growth ever in history. And with all of the doom and gloom in the world, it's probably worth reminding ourselves that we are living in a golden age of economic prosperity. In the year 2000, global economic output was $34 trillion. Today, it's triple that, and almost 100 times what it was in 1960. In the last 10 years, despite everything that went on in the world, the economy still grew by 50%. It gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, industry. This is an interesting one. Modern industry has been the driving force of that growth, but some of our most important resources still rely on low-cost labour from people using basic hand tools. Even still, global supply chains and modern technology would have allowed countries to participate in this overwhelming growth trend. Obviously, some have benefited more than others, but the global economy gets a 7 out of 10. Altogether, that gives the Earth an average score of 7.6 out of 10, which puts it way up here. Again, this scale is definitely not made for ranking the entire global economy, but hey, nobody's using this list for anything serious, so I hope you all forgive me for having a little bit of fun with it. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.